sir i think uh, we'll start uh, let the ma'am join yes okay sir amit uh, will start ma'am will join you with us shortly uh, one minute one minute Uh, Dr. Pankaj, we are live right now. So take a pause of five seconds and then start. We are live. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Pankaj Patil from the Medical Services Team of MQ Pharmaceuticals at Pune. I welcome you all to the Empowered Webinar Series. This is an initiative taken by MQ Pharmaceuticals in order to disseminate the latest happenings or updates in the field of medicine to healthcare professionals across India through a series of webinars by eminent experts and renowned faculty from the field. Today our speciality focus is gynecology and the topic of discussion is ovarian stimulation in PCOS and endometriosis impact on ovarian reserve. And to talk on the more, uh, we have with us a renowned faculty uh, with us straight from London, Dr. Anil Budi, sir. Sir, thank you so much for accepting our invitation for today's talk. And let me take this opportunity to introduce uh, sir. Uh, Dr. Anil Budi, sir, was trained in Mumbai and came to the UK in 1998, uh, where he was admitted as a full member of the Royal College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists in 1999 and became a qualified consultant uh, gynecologist in 2005. Currently, sir, is the director of Homerton Fertility Center in London. The Homerton Fertility Center conducts extensive fertility treatments, has a very active research development, and is one of the leading training centers for assisted conception. His medical interests include teaching, making reproductive medicine simple to learn and understand for trainees. He teaches regularly uh, via uh, social platforms like Facebook and uh, also, uh, he has uh, many YouTube videos on uh, different topics in the gynecology. So now, uh, Dr. Bhati Dori Patil, uh, she will be joining with us uh, in shortly, uh, and uh, she is the panelist member for today's talk. Yes, sir, uh, by the time ma'am joins, uh, without wasting any time, uh, we'll start the session. So, over to you. I'm still on mute. So we can hear you. Uh, okay, can I, uh, can I start? Uh, yes, sir. Just uh, share the presentation and you can start. Perfect. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Dr. Anil Gudi. I'm a consultant in reproductive medicine, as Pankaj has introduced me. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's uh, something which I, I teach online, and, and this is a slightly different uh, mode of teaching. I think it makes teaching easier and more accessible to people. And I think it should get encouraged more and more rather than more sitting meetings. So let's go and talk about ovarian stimulation. And now I'll, I'll, I'll come down to two different concepts. What are the principles? The, to understand ovarian stimulation, let's look at, uh, hello, Bharti. Uh, let's look at two uh, areas which you need to understand. One is controlled ovarian stimulation, and the other is ovulation induction. Two differ completely. And if you are talking about polycystic ovarian syndrome and its stimulation, you'll need to identify what you are setting out to do. If you decide that you want to do produce one or two follicles or do IUI, that becomes ovulation induction, which means you're aiming to have one follicle growing. Now, if you want to do IVF, it changes. It changes in terms of the amount of drugs you give and the aim is to produce more follicles and harvest more sites. So today we're not talking of ovulation induction. We are going to talk of ovarian stimulation for PCOS. And the aim is here is increase in strength. So what is the challenge you see with PCOS? There is, out of all these cases, PCOS tends to be one of the most difficult challenges. And if you see the questions I get asked across on the social media, a large number of them are on PCOS. That's because you see more and more cases of PCOS, they're getting more com complex, looking at changes in diet, changes in weight that affects 
uh, modern civilization. So let's look at the question. Why does stimulation fail? It's a commonest question you get asked. Why do some PCOS fail to stimulate? Try what you may, and you don't get follicles growing. Sometimes you end up stimulating the ovary well, and you get only five follicles growing. And across the last 20 years, were we not taught that the starting dose for PCOS stimulation should be 150 of FSH. Now, I will act as a provocator. I will say that that foundation statement is wrong. It is challenging, it is controversial, and there'll be many who will sit up and tell me I am wrong. But let me start this lecture by saying, our stimulations in some of the PCOS are completely wrong. To understand this, let's go back to the basics. And those of you who see me online will know that I will always dwell to the basics because without understanding reproductive medicine as a, as a part, without understanding why the ovary behaves in a certain way, what is the relationship between the hypothalamic pituitary and the ovary, you'll find it very difficult to understand complexities that surround IVF treatment. So the first concept is, can we break the FSH threshold? And the next question is, what is FSH threshold? Let's go back to PCOS before we talk of FSH threshold. Why is PCOS important? And if you look at the very morphology of PCOS, there is evidence that in PCOS, you have more follicles, far more follicles than in a normal woman. And also a large number of these follicles are arrested in development but are capable of stimulation by exogenous FSH. Compare the follicle distribution across a normal ovary, an anovulatory PCOS, and an ovulatory PCOS. Our focus of knowing if stimulation is going to be difficult, if you ask me what is one symptom that will tell you that this PCO ovary is going to make your stimulation difficult, and what is that symptom that or sign that will also complicate matters? And it is irregularity of period. And what irregularity of period tells you is that the metabolic component of PCOS is more evident. And whenever the metabolic concept is more evident, your stimulations are going to be far more difficult. Next, to understand the FSH threshold, let's go to AMH. Now, if somebody tells me that AMH is a test for ovarian reserve, I will put a big question mark. AMH was never supposed to come in as a test for ovarian reserve. That was not the aim of AMH in nature. Let's look at what AMH does, and you will understand how PCOS works. It's expressed in small anterior follicles. It limits the follicles undergoing initiation. So the role of AMH is to act like a break. It holds back follicles. Think of a balloon, you know, and strings, multiple balloons. And what the image does it, it pulls on those strings and holds the follicles back. So all follicles don't get stimulated. Now, how it works in poor responders is fascinating, but how it works in PCOS is different. Now, what happens in PCOS is that as the AMH level goes up, follicles start getting more resistant. The small, the AMH level is quite high in these small follicles and they do not get released from this break. And that's the reason why many of the follicles get held back. Now let's come to the FSH threshold concept. What happens in nature? In nature, nature's job is to break the threshold of one follicle. In very simple terms, you want to get one follicle above the 10 millimeter mark in stimulation. If you do induction, exactly the same. And that period of getting it to 10 millimeter depends on the rise of FSH in the first few days of your cycle. Whenever the pituitary rise of FSH can break the threshold, push the follicle up beyond the 10 millimeter mark, there is recruitment. 
And that is breaking the FSA threshold. Change this. And rather than one follicle, you're going to see 20 follicles. There's no way you can break the FSA threshold of three or four follicles unless we get a stimulation with it, which means you decide I'll give you a dose of 150 to stimulate the ovary. And then you realize that only five are recruited. And what it automatically means is you have broken the threshold of five follicles, not a threshold of 10 follicles. So if you want to understand the threshold, go back to looking at four areas. And if you're treating PCOS, I'll always tell you, document your four areas. What is the AMH? The AMH tells you how resistant that ovary is. What is the LH? Go back to the two-cell, two-gonatrophin concept. Follicles move from an androgenic environment to an estrogenic environment. That success leads to ovulatory cycles. The failure makes the PCOS more complicated. Look at the ovarian volume. Many of us forget that ovarian volume is something which is dealing from the theca cell component, the LH, and suddenly we are looking at only antral follicle counts, and that comes last. Now, if you look at the recent publication which came up, and they said, well, what is more important? Is it the ovarian volume which links towards insulin resistance, or is it follicles? And the evidence is pushing towards the volume, pushing towards the theca cell component. It is there where you can see the insulin resistance rise. Now, have a look at this triangle. It's my way of simplifying stimulation. I call it the goody triangle, just because I have nothing else to do. So, and what it simplifies is there are two types of PCOS that you see. There's one type of PCOS that shows an AMH which would be between 25 and 50 p molar liter. And I think it would be between divided by seven. I think you'll get a value in, in your region. You can see follicles that can are, are four millimeter or above. And these ovaries respond very well to your normal stimulation. Why? What does a, no, a larger follicle tell you? A larger follicle tells you that it, there's been a successful breakthrough. It has it is slowly being released from the shackles of AMH. And that is the most important thing. If you can stimulate, give a, a dose of 150 of FSH, these ovaries stimulate very, very well. Go back to the other side, ovaries which are very large, which have an image that is very, very high. Look at the ovaries, the anterior follicles are smaller. There is a larger thicker component. These ovaries do not respond. And you'll see them in your practice. You, you, you will often, you know, I'll get an email saying, I tried stimulating, I tried doing a step up and it did not succeed. Right from the beginning, try and find out which ovary is going to stimulate well and which ovary is not going to stimulate well. And that is something which will make you understand this ovary better. The second thing is look at the thicker component. Why? Let's say when I trained in 20 years ago, you would rarely see a hypo-hypo. Now, you see combinations of PCO and hypo-hypo. The pituitary being shut down, but the morphological element which continues. Why? Girls are changing. You know, when I grew up, you, a size zero was considered to be abnormal. Now, any size other than size zero is considered to be abnormal. But you also realize that there are many girls who are you know, working within that fixed frame of weight, which allows you to have a re regular cycles. When this girl loses a bit of weight, her pituitary switches off. And you, you start seeing women with PCO. You start seeing women with hypo, -hypo. Look at the thicca cell. If you see a multicystic ovary, get your antenna up. You may be seeing a subtle hypo hypox somewhere. A hypothalamic amenorrhea rather than a hypothalamic pituitary amenorrhea. Next is count your follicles. 
So if you look at the types of PCOS, that's my drawing. I'm not a great artist, but th that's how I depict. I draw a lot. Uh, and on the left, you see bigger follicles, follicles which can stimulate well. Other side, you see smaller follicles. I call this the good PCOS. Have a look at the PCOS. You see much larger follicles. Ovaries are not very large. These patients give you the best results. They stimulate very well. They get to blastocyst. Let's look at what I call the bad PCOS. 60, 70, 80 follicles. Ovulation induction often fails. Clomiphene fails. Letrozole fails. FSH fails. And you get to doing IVF and IVF fails. So I divide them. And again, as I said, my general role is to simplify complicated matters. And that's the, the joy of looking at uh, polycystic ovaries. So let's look at one set of polycystic ovaries. Number one, let's look at ovaries that are polycystic. Cycles may be irregular or mildly irregular. PCOS, eight to 10 follicles per ovary. LH less than 10. AMH about 30 to 40 p milliliter, divide that by seven. Normal androgens, follicle size more than four. Let's look at PCOS of a different type. 11 to 20 follicles per ovary, LH that is high, AMH that goes much higher, borderline androgens. So as soon as androgens come up, androgens complicate a lot. Androgens increase the resistance. What? And think about it. Look at the thicker cell. Thicker cell is androgen dependent. Thicker cell reflects the LH from the pituitary. And a thicker gives you an idea of what's going to go wrong. And you see many small or mixed follicles. In ovarian stimulation, they do very much the same. You know, if you look at the ovary that is, uh, has larger follicles, they do better with a step up. They produce good quality blastocysts. They are more mature oocytes. There's less risk of ovarian hyperstimulation with an agonist, an analog trigger. The other type of polycystic ovaries is more complicated. You don't see a response. You see only two or three follicles growing. You've told the patient that you've got polycystic ovaries, we'll get a lot of eggs. You end up getting three eggs, four eggs. These do better with a step down. There's a much poorer progression to, to good embryo quality. And there are many mature oocytes. Now, th those of you who have l attended my lecture on polycystic ovaries, I dissect right into the cellular level to explain what is that goes wrong in that follicle, because things do go wrong in that follicle. Insulin is quite resistant, is quite a horrible thing that occurs to the ovary. And it's very important to understand that uh, follicle, these women with irregular cycles, large ovaries, there's something going wrong in this ovary, which insulin resistance causes. So let's go back to my diagrammatic representation. You start with stimulation when you, whenever you want, you started after a pre-treat, giving the pill, Proganova, or you do it with your period and you give a dose of FSH 150. I'm not talking about recombinant or HMG, I'll come to it later, but I'll, I'll challenge that concept that giving recombinant is a waste of time. And you start the antagonist on day four or day five. Now, if that does not work, let's look at the slightly more controversial way of treating PCOS. You do a step down. And this is something which I firmly believe, and I will defend it quite aggressively if you challenge me. And I have a, have a look at my the way I think. You have a small number of follicles, and what do we do? You give a high dose of FSH to push three or four follicles. Okay, that is low, you know, low reserve, and we believe a dose of 450 will work. Completely bizarre. You've got a large number of follicles, all compacted, all compacted in one place, resistant, and you give them a smaller dose. So in my practice, it works the other way around. Poor responders, you go low. You widen the recruitment window. In PCOS, depending on what is the, the AMH 
And what happens if 150 fails? You go up. You start breaking the effort threshold with a higher dose and do a step down. And then differentiating which ovaries will do better with a step up and which ovaries will do better with a step down is what will come with time. And here, if you see where 150 has failed, go up, go up to 300, and then take a slow dip. Do you have to drop on day five? The answer is no. If you feel that a recruitment has not happened, you continue with that dose. But do it only if your first cycle with 150 has not given you the desired effect. Again, the aim is break the threshold of multiple follicles. And this is a folliculogram. And if you are not using a folliculogram, I'll ask you, use it. Why? Because remember, as humans, numbers don't come to us as easily, unless you're a mathematician, as come pictures. We are people who are built on pictorial thinking. And that's why we become doctors. Otherwise, we would have become engineers and got settled down far earlier than what you're doing now. And if you look at this, this is a case where we had seen a step up uh, fail. And so you completely changed the setting. You gave a, a dose of 300 and you waited and you see the recruitment. And where do you see the recruitment? You see the recruitment on day five, day six. Do the follicles cross the 10 millimeter mark? Do they get recruited? But also have a look at what happens with the estrogen. The estrogen is the first sign of granular cell activity. Does the estrogen rise? And that's something which is important. Day five, day six, you start seeing the rise, but also see what happens later on. The estrogen starts doubling, doubling at a phenomenal rate. These are the women where whatever trigger you give, and if you give the HCG trigger, Believe me, these are the women who land up in the intensive care. But these women also may have a very happy stimulation with an analog trigger. I'm not going to go into length with what do you do with an agonist? Do you give an agonist or an antagonist protocol? There is no role for a long protocol in PCOS. There's absolutely no role. And I think it is not worthy of discussion because it is the one reason where you are left defenseless. Remember one of the most important things as a doctor, what you want is at times your treatments go wrong. At times your, the ovary goes beyond your control. The antagonist protocol gives you a chance to bail out without compromising on the patient's health. And that is something which is extremely important. So you have PCOS, you are not certain what protocol, you are doing batching of cycles. You can still batch on an antagonist protocol using pre-treatment. Please always use the antagonist protocol. Then we come to the trigger. When we start looking at the trigger, let's look at what triggers we have. And I'll explain to you why some triggers work well and some triggers don't work well in, in IVF. Let's look at this chart. And it's a, a fantastic chart, which was published by Peter Humayri. And what he says is, in nature, trigger is LH. Any trigger that mimics LH gives LH-like activity. So when you have a look at the slide, you see in nature, there is a, an ascending arm, <coughs> that is 14 hours. There is a plateau of 14 hours, and there is a descending arm of 20 hours. The entire LH-like activity, which is the rise of LH, it's not a rise that goes up and down. It's a rise that is a gradual rise, spreads over 48 hours. When you give HCG, HCG is not LH, it mimics LH. It gives LH-like activity. And if you have a look at it, the rise continues for seven days. Look at the agonist trigger, the generic analog trigger, and your rise is four hours, and within 24 hours, the LH has gone. So if you look at it and say, well, what gives a higher LH than nature? It is an analog trigger. 
Does it lower the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation? The answer is yes. HCG is the premier cause of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. So if you're giving an agonist trigger, what dose do you give? You can give, you know, we use bisarolin and we use the recommended dose is 0.5 milligram. We tend to use two milligram. You can do the same with Lupride. They, there is no dose finding study. We don't know what is the exact dose. And there's no harm in doubling or tripling the dose. The pituitary doesn't go into a shutdown. I believe, and give us about a year, we're doing one of the largest studies on analog trigger. Uh, how it works, you know, how do we know it works? Uh, can we predict the success of the analog trigger? And in a year's time, we'll give you the data on close to eight, 600 cycles. And an agonist trigger is the only trigger that you use. Now, you'll come to me and say, uh, Dr. Goody, I can't freeze embryos. I have to do a fresh transfer. My laboratory works on a fresh transfer. And I recognize that there will be laboratories, there will be clinics that predominantly do fresh embryo transfers and frozen transfers don't work very well. And the question asked is, if you give an agonist trigger, what happens to pregnancy rates? Have a look at this slide. In nature, you need LH-like activity to achieve a pregnancy, which means you need progesterone levels to rise and the corpus luteum needs to survive. And if you have a look at it, the once you give HCG, the effect lasts, LH-like activity effect lasts between day nine and day 10, and the activity still continues. The corpus luteum continues to survive. The luteal phase is corpus luteum dependent. It's not endometrium. Think again, it is corpus luteum dependent. And corpus luteal, that, that will help you to understand luteal phase defect. Our entire concentration in luteal phase defect moves towards the endometrium. The endometrium is a window from which the corpus luteum speaks. And the corpus luteum tells you about luteal phase defect. What happens in agonist trigger? Within 36 to 48 hours, LH activity starts declining and your luteal phase is disrupted. Corpus luteal activity is disrupted. Pregnancy rates decline. If you give an agonist trigger without HCG, you will get low pregnancy rates. The only drug that rescues the luteal phase in a fresh cycle is HCG. Give HCG in a PCOS patient, God forbid, but some of them will go into hospital and there'll be a few women who will die. The question comes up here is, can I improve the channel? I, I still want to do a fresh transfer. And there is an option. Can we improve implantation rate in fresh cycles with an agonist trigger? And the answer is yes. If you gave 1,500 of HCG, not 5,000, not 2,500, not 10,000, 1,500 of HCG, on the day of ovum pickup, after giving an agonist trigger, the chance of pregnancy will be absolutely brilliant. Ongoing pregnancy rates are very similar to an HCG trigger. OHHS rate also significantly lower. When Peter Humedin did this study, he said there was a zero ovarian hyperstimulation rate. But if you look at new studies coming in, the rate of ovarian hyperstimulation, which is moderate to severe, may be between 2 and 5%. Which again tells us is that if you give a small amount of HCG, there will be women who will go in with severe OHSS. If you want to, there's no way of completely preventing it. <coughs> but yes, there is a way of reducing the risk and maintaining your results. And you can do that when you give a very small dose of HCG on the day of ovum pickup. Can you give it on a day of ET? Think again. The corpus luteum disruption is complete by ET day. Intervention on a day of ET in an agonist cycle is a complete waste of time. That endometrium has been disrupted. The corpus luteum is completely disrupted. It is unlikely to work. So if you want to intervene and you're willing to take that risk, then give a small dose of HCG on the day of ovum pickup. 
Why an agonist trigger? The aim is to prevent ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Years ago, we used to say the prevention is total. It's not. It is almost total. Some of the very bad PCOS will, or you know, large PCOS, huge amount of LH will end up going into hospital, but they don't go up with very bad ovarian hyperstimulation. Think again, if I could convince a large number of you, I think many of you all do give agonist trigger, but those who are doing the long protocol, uh, if you're doing it, stop it, use the analog trigger, and I can assure you, your success rates will get better. The, the, the next few slides are about what we normally do. Do we give metformin? Theoretically, if you see, metformin does have a role to play. Metformin lowers insulin resistance, and insulin resistance is the cause of these problems. If you look at many studies, looking at metformin and IVF, there was no difference in stimulation, IVF or clinical criteria. Again, looked at a double-blinded study, no difference in total number of F, total dose of FSH, number of oocytes, fertilization rates. And a recent study which came from Professor Balin said, a short course of metformin does not lower the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. And that is in 2016. And that's what it shows, including it didn't increase pregnancy rates. And if you look at the uh, ovarian hyperstimulation rates, which is moderate to severe, very similar. And remember, this was done in a part of England where 20% of the population are South Asian, Indian, Pakistani, and Bangladeshi. So it does reflect what uh, you know, the Indian population in uh, the cities. The other problem which we see is we have kept talking about the ovary. We've kept talking about how to break the threshold, how to look at what trigger to give, how the antagonist protocol works, how the agonist trigger will help you to get better quality eggs probably and give you a, a, a you know the risk of and lower the risk of over, overstimulation. But also there's something starts going wrong in the endometrium. <coughs> there is a problem with endometrial receptivity. As soon as your high levels of estrogen go up and high levels of progesterone go up, what, you, what happens is the endometrium starts getting more progesteronized because follicles start getting, gunner cells getting more luteinized. And I, I think I'll be talking on this in a couple of weeks where we will, I will show you what a biopsy of the endometrium does in PCOS during stimulation. Also, contractility increases. And what increases contractility? Estrogen increases contractility. HCG increases contractility. High progesterone levels also probably decrease implantation. Again, people put a big question mark over it. We don't have the, the data very, very clear, but I think there is the data is slowly and steadily going towards, a, probably if your progesterone levels are going to rise, it may be better to freeze the embryos. Also, the most smaller follicles you have, the chances of having a higher progesterone also increase. OHHS, and then the success of cryopreservation. preservation. Now, if the progesterone level increases beyond five nanomole per liter, we tend to freeze embryos. I think you'll have to decide on what happens with your practice. If you look at many conferences, they'll say, well, the data, we don't know, but I think there is more convincing data coming in that these women do better in a frozen cycle. Now in 2007, Gesinger did a study which they demonstrated that if you gave a GNRH analog trigger and did a frozen embryo replacement, your success rate will be better than having given HCG in a, frozen, in a fresh cycle. We did that and we were one of the first clinics in Europe to have taken the lead of showing that in a large population, if you move to an agonist trigger, your positive would give you a clinical pregnancy rate of close to 66.7%, which was, I think we were one of the first people in, the, in the Europe to have done a study on such, in such large numbers. What do you do when you freeze the embryos? 
allow the ovary to settle down, it takes between two and six weeks, and then start preparing the endometrium. Patient tells you, I can't wait. Wait for another six weeks. Can you accelerate the process? Yes, you can give the antagonist after egg collection, and then you can decide to continue it. And that seems to break the corpus luteum. Very funny, isn't it? The LH is blocked, but still cetotide works. And it's a very, very old system. And I, I believe that the entire pathway is slightly different where your antagonist continues to work. Avoid down-regulating straight after egg collection because you end up seeing a, high, a, a slightly higher increase in ovarian uh, hyperstimulation. I, the last topic I come to, which is still continues to be my favorite topic, which drug do you give? When I got trained in India, and IVF was just making a comeback, and Gonalef was making a comeback. You know, Gonalef came up with a new drug, and they convinced us you know, that FSH is the best drug. You give recombinant, and it works. Very convincing, isn't it? That the LH levels are high, you give FSH, and you don't need LH. And it's a wrong concept. It's a very wrong concept because what it does not happen in nature. In nature, your pituitary doesn't release just one hormone. And if you look at the studies which were looking at uh, the LH levels, yes, in the beginning of your cycle, the LH levels go up. But later on, they start going down. But what happens when you give HMG to PCOS is that that initial rise of LH knocks off certain follicles, which means don't recruit a large number of follicles your chances of lowering progesterone are slightly better and slightly, you see a slightly fewer number of very small follicles. And you'll say, well, that's what you feel. And I, I believe that if I have to come across a statement that challenges and says that don't give recombinant and give HMG, I have to prove it. And again, th these were studies which looked at if you use highly purified HMG versus recombinant, what happens to success rates? This is in fresh cycles. This is not in frozen cycles. I don't think it matters in a frozen cycle. If you look at it, live birth rate with HMG was significantly better than the recombinant FSH. HMG gives better, better results. The cost is also reduced. If you again look at another aspect, and what, what you want to look at is on the hormonal aspect, what does HMG do and what does recombinant FSH do? Let's look at the long protocol using HMG versus recombinant FSH and have a look at this. Your progesterone levels use, when you use HMG are lower than when you use recombinant FSH. So if you believe in that concept that you don't need a very high progesterone level, then you're looking at your recombinant FSH. Uh, HMG, uh, sorry, re recombinant FSH giving you a higher progesterone. Have a look at the antagonist protocol and very much the same. So if you want to have the best chance of going for a fresh transfer, go back to HMG. And if you say, oh my, uh, the ovary did not respond, don't blame the drug, blame the protocol. Think about your threshold. If you've not broken the threshold of follicles, it's unlikely you will get a good response. There will be some PCOS that are extremely difficult that end up causing us a lot of problems. If you look at the success rate again, HMG does better. Again, it links itself to the rise of progesterone on the day of trigger. That's the rationale of, of giving it. This slide will tell you that there is a difference between the two drugs. Recombinant causes more follicles to grow. HMG will give you a lower response, but may also give you the best chance. Thank you. So that uh, covers the talk on uh, polycystic ovaries and ovarian stimulation. So I, I may have exceeded my time slightly, but uh, that uh, gives us a slightly good information into uh, how we stimulate these ovaries, which PCOS we should think of stimulating on a step up, a step down, and which ovaries we stimulate on a step down. The antagonist protocol and an analog trigger. 
thank you. There's a talk on the uh, endometriosis. Do you want me to do that and then take questions? Uh, no, sir. I, I think uh, it's okay. So uh, there are some questions that I will take up, uh, but uh, after Bharti Ma'am's uh, comments. Uh, so thank you so much, sir, for your wonderful uh, talk and uh, deliberated in depth uh, uh, in uh, explaining about the ovarian stimulation various protocols uh, in the PCOS patients. Uh, we have also been joined by Dr. Bharti Dore Patels uh, from Pune. Uh, Ma'am is a renowned gynecologist and uh, uh, infertility expert. Uh, she is practicing at Pune. Uh, she has been the vice president of Foxy, and currently also she is uh, president for the Pune Ops and Gynec Society. So welcome, ma'am, and thanks a lot for joining with us. Uh, so now, ma'am, uh, the session is open for your comments. Hello, Bharti. Thank you very much for getting me here. Yeah, thank you very much. Congratulations. You've done wonderful. This was a real, uh, very good insight and good lecture. And people would be very happy to understand the concept. Anil is always uh, like this. He wants to go to the core of the subject and his own concept. He would be developing and telling the people and that was very important what uh, dr Anil said and thank you very much for joining uh, and many gynecologists would get uh, helpful tips from you he first of all pcos should not be kept in one basket that is what his first concept was all pcos are not same pcos they will work differently they will uh, respond differently and you have to look at PCO differently with the different different uh, aspects of the PCOs. The secondly, he explained about the protocols, step up protocol and step down protocol, which would be the best according to the different PCO patient. So not all patients of PCOs start with a small dose and then to increase for IVF with a complete different scenario for ovulation stimulation and ovulation reduction. These are the two different things which we explained initially. It was very, very simple to understand who is a practicing gynecologist or an IVF consultant. And next was his talk on the trigger, which was been very well elaborated. The trigger, if you give agonist, we all were worried about like, what to do with the luteal phase and how can we rescue that luteal phase. That was his a uh, very important aspect uh, we have to know that when do we give that HCG if at all we give a good instructor and how can we rescue that. Can we have all frozen cycles of PCOS and then go for the FUT? But few centers are not well equipped for the transplantation. So how can we rescue that luteal phase and do the fresh transfer? That was a third aspect of this talk. And the fourth aspect was the progesterone rise with FSH and HMG. That's a very different concept altogether he opened. Like PCO patient, what exactly happens if you give HMG to start? Uh, we had our concept that LH is high in PCO patient. So HMG again has FSH and LH and LH would again add up in the initial phase and the recruitment would be hampering. But probably the small follicles work out from me saying is that if we don't want or they are very difficult to catch their threshold, that breaking threshold was very important concept to see today. And that is how the HMG works, which was very wonderful. And probably because of that, there is no progesterone rise in compared compared if you compare FSH and LH stimulation, HMG stimulation. It has got less progesterone rise, which gives a good pregnancy rate. So overall, I feel he's been completely uh, looked at PCOS ovarian, ovarian stimulation, uh, and that is going to give you a better pregnancy rate. So thank you very much. I was really enjoyed, and probably we'll take the questions because the audience wants that question and answers from Dr. Goody. So Dr. Pankaj? In fact, uh, yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, there are a few questions uh, we, are get, we are getting and uh, also sir we are getting the comments uh, for the wonderful talk also. So there is one question from uh, Dr. Sujata, she is from Nagpur and uh, she is asking about uh, uh, which one is better, what to go for, the single trigger, HCG trigger or the double trigger? Uh, uh, I, I think, I, I'm sorry if I've confused you. 
Now, uh, question number one is, we are talking of PCO. Now, the, the initial trigger has to be an agonist trigger. There is no option there. Option two is, if you ask me what is the best thing to do, is to prove them to you. If you can come back and tell me that I can't freeze embryos. My laboratory is not equipped for large scale freezing. In those cases, HCG in the day of OM at a very small dose, 1,500, uh, that will give you pregnancy rates comparable to a frozen but in, give you a give you 2 and 5 percent of uh, Now, there are two things here. There's something known as a dual trigger, which is different from a double trigger. A dual trigger is what happens on the day the advanced trigger and HCG is later. A double trigger is different, and a double trigger is a trigger which you give one after the other. The reason is completely different. The reason is not PCOS. The reason is to look at maturity. But that's an entirely different discussion. So there is another question from Dr. Manisha. He's from Bangalore. So you mentioned the luteal phase defect can be noted with a GNRH agonist trigger. So can we use natural progesterone for supplement in a luteal phase, at least for first trimester? I think if you've got the, the woman has got pregnant, you'll have to, the luteal phase defect has gone. Uh, the, the, the pregnancy is not a luteal phase uh, defect. The, preg, the luteal phase is the life of a corpus luteum is known as a luteal phase. So again, I'll go back to the basics. The woman who got pregnant, well done. Whether you give progesterone in a pregnancy to prevent miscarriage is a completely different discussion with a big question mark. Right. Do you give increase your progesterone in a frozen cycle? Completely different question. Here, a pregnancy achieved role of progesterone is debatable. It is a period between embryo suicide retrieval and result. Where if you do not have HCG, your pregnancy rate with an agonist cycle will be very low. Correct, right, sir. So there's one question from Dr. Mahesh Joshi from Pune. Uh, he is asking which one is the better predictor for ovarian reserve? Is it the AMH or, or the antrophilical count? Uh, uh, have you been to the Olympics? If you ask me which is a better race, is it a hundred meter race or a marathon race? I don't know. And uh, I remember one thing. Uh, let, let's change the subject slightly and say, you know, give me one test that tells me that uh, the woman is uh, young. Any test? No. Have a think about what the AMH tells you. If you have just the AMH, you will go wrong. You need all four parameters. You need your AMH. And AMH tells you not about reserve, it tells you about the pull that the follicles have by nature. It restricts the follicles to grow. Follicles have to break the, the pull of AMH to get recruited and grow. So if you want to have the, if you want to say what is the two best test of reserve, reserve, is test of reserve in age. Age, 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 age. Then comes AMH and the follicle and ovarian volume, and then you can uh, uh, choose. But I don't say, I, I don't give singular answers, because there are no singular answers for all to me. Dr. Anil, I yeah. would like to ask you one question, which was been given yes, by my fellows. Hello? Yes, are yes. You, yeah. The progesterone rise, as you said, at the day of trigger, at the day of trigger, we see that if the progesterone rises there, those patients will probably go for the frozen embryo transfer cycle. We freeze the all embryo. Yes. But is there any study? Is there any study which is showing the progesterone rise at the trigger, but progesterone evaluation at the time of ET, which is coming down a little bit, is it going to be 
beneficial if you transfer the same cycle the embryos have anybody studied that i uh, see that, 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 that two things to it one is that if your progesterone rises is it hmm. an or non effect and the answer is no there will be women who even with high progesterone levels uh, on the day of trigger will achieve a successful pregnancy but pregnancy rates tend to be lower now uh, if the progesterone if you, the, the discussion is what should be the progesterone level in a fresh cycle is very debatable we believe that similar to a frozen cycle if you increase your progesterone levels very high you get a good pregnancy rate right? and it would be quite good to look at the paper very recently by peter humaden who demonstrates that in a fresh cycle if you increase progesterone level to very high or very low your fresh cycle pregnancy rates also go down okay so uh, and- it is something which i believe that one of our fellows is uh also doing this study and uh, in the next year we'll, we'll we'll give you some answer yeah the progesterone rise at the time of trigger is predictable predictors but progesterone rise or um, progesterone fall at the day of et the progesterone rise was there at the time of trigger but progesterone fall was there at the day of et is it going to make any difference or the same uh, i've got my colleague mr amit also here so you know it, 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 I, i asked him to come here because he's asking very difficult questions i need some help um, <laughs> you know what does progesterone do progesterone creates a lag so you got a window that window shifts to the left that cannot recover later on it means that your receptivity window which is 120 hours you lost if your so position this- drops on the day of transfer again there is some evidence that if it drops below 50 nanomole per liter pregnancy rates are lower okay so it is no question about that fine and what about your estrogen and progesterone ratio you mentioned in your uh slides the people are asking here the question about can you elaborate on the estrogen progesterone ratio which you were saying at the day of trigger how it is going to be affecting your decision uh, 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 those who do that do mention that the rise of the, the ratio does have a negative impact. i don't measure it i uh, I, i believe that uh, reproductive medicine can be made simple so i Uh, I, I generally look at the progesterone, and uh, if in case the progesterone starts going beyond the nanomole, I do freeze the embryo. I, I have a very, uh, in my center, we tend to have a very aggressive policy towards freezing. It's given us very good results, and given us almost zero percent severe open hypostatic syndrome rates. Okay. So, Pankaj, Dr. Pankaj, any questions? Uh, yes, uh, one more question uh, is. is a question from dr amit who is from solapur he is asking uh, what is the effect of repeated stimulation on the number of oocytes retrieved ah that's a very good question a lot of our patients ask me it's, it's, it's true look at it as a bank you go in and t- rob your bank every day and one fine day the money goes unfortunately that's not how uh, how ovaries are uh, again if you go back to that triangle i drew nature recruits a set number of follicles so from a primordial a rise occurs and that middle zone what you see on a scan is a lose use it or lose it okay? nature is telling you these are the follicles available those follicles are, are going to die anyway it is called the continuous or the wave format of the human and they, it doesn't matter you if you don't stimulate them the number of follicles will still die. So you don't lower somebody's reserve by repeated stimulation. Okay, thank you so much, sir. I think the clock has already ticked into four. So I think we'll conclude our session here only. And okay. So thank you, sir. Okay. It was yes. it was an excellent interaction, and I think Amit is sitting next to you there. Thank you very much, both of you. You've been wonderful. Thank and you very much. Connect- connecting you back it was a wonderful again uh, yeah.
<laughs> thank you very much and i think pankaj will now conclude so once again thank you so much sir for for your wonderful talk i think uh, we remain with one the talk on the endometriosis uh, maybe i think in future uh, we'll take uh, that also and uh, thank you bhati ma'am once again to you for joining us as a panelist and putting across your expert comments and the questions as well and all the viewers uh, we are joined uh, for today's talk uh, thank you so much for taking out your precious time and uh, we'll see you soon with another topic soon so stay posted and have a good day thank you very much thank you bharti thank you thank you